Um, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the sector update for engineering apprenticeship standards. My name is Andrew Buckingham, and I will be presenting um, the short course this afternoon. It's unlikely, I think, to stretch for the full hour as scheduled, but we will uh, m make sure that we stop when it stops being useful, basically, and keep going whilst it's still useful. Um, I'm joined in the background by Bryony Leonard, as it says there on that first slide, who is the sector manager for engineering. She is the expert when it comes to apprenticeship standards and their applications. So the, the, the session as it stands will be a little bit of an overview, but the emphasis really is not only on the information that I'm going to provide you, but also giving you the opportunity to, um, to um, ask questions of, of people in real time who know what they're talking about, and Brian is certainly that. So let's get started. Um, the first thing, or one of the first things to do, um, well, in, in a second, what we're actually going to be covering today is a quick overview of the standard, um, uh, have a look at the standards that are in development, ask you some questions about how you perceive the, the gaps in provision and things that are missing that you think shouldn't be um, to sort of uh, to inform future developments, uh, a little bit on, on program and, and uh, endpoint assessment, and then some plans for the future. Not a huge amount of content, but um, what there is is going to be succinct and relevant, hopefully, to you. So I'm going to broadcast uh, certainly the first poll, Keelan, so that everyone can see what's going on. So many of you, most of you, some of you, five out of um, 11 have delivered the SACE apprenticeships in the past or are doing so. A couple have delivered the standards before August. Some have started just now. So we've got a full range, effectively. No one brand spanking new to apprenticeships and a few of you delivering different qualifications. Those two... Um, delegates who have said that they're delivering different engineering qualifications, could you pop that in poll two, just right there in the text box there? Uh, and the main question, a better understanding of now the new qualifications and the endpoint assessments, which we will be covering uh, briefly. So the main focus is, is, is on the new bits, it's on the endpoint assessment, which is fair enough. First part of the presentation then, uh, the overview of the apprenticeship standards themselves. Well. The Richard Review set out the radical reforms of the English apprenticeship system um, in a similar way to the Wolf Report did in the, in the classroom. And the outcomes of the review that were, um, that were that basically the current apprenticeships as offered in England weren't fit for purpose and that employers should have a greater say in what an apprenticeship should consist of. And so one of the requirements for the new apprenticeship standards is to get that employment, get that uh, involvement, should I say, um, of employers and employees designed by employers for employers. Um, now, the new apprenticeship standards consist, can, uh, consist of about two thirds to two to three pages of an outline of the job role and the skills and the knowledge and the behaviours that will be required in there. You can think of this as a job description which tells prospective apprentices and almost as importantly their parents and the members of staff delivering this stuff what will be required of them and what they'll cover in the period, the full period of their apprenticeship. Alongside the standard, each occupation will also have an assessment plan which outlines how the apprenticeship will be delivered and eventually assessed. This document contains details of any qualifications that might be required, either mandatory or optional, uh, and the training content, as well as how the apprenticeship will be assessed at the end of the programme to confirm the full occupational competency. Now, the endpoint assessment element is currently the most important part of an apprenticeship, and the assessment plan will outline the timescales that this activity needs to cover, and the individual requirements of the assessment and how the assessment will be graded. Now, it also contains information on how apprentices can retake elements of the assessment if they don't achieve the bits they need to achieve when they do so, um, and also who will be responsible for the quality assurance process that needs to accompany that. Now, the points on the slides here outline the key points that make up an apprenticeship standard. Now, the requirements of an apprenticeship standard have changed slightly over the last four years, um, which is, can't come as a surprise to most people, as the whole educational um, uh, arena seems to be in a constant state of flux and has done for many years. Um, and so, since the first employer groups for, formed to create their occupational roles some four years ago, they have changed. Now, the main change has been the recent or relatively recent introduction of the employer levy, which comes into effect or came into effect in April and May of 2017. And that's the levy that employers with a wage bill above three million pounds per annum um, have to pay uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs a half a percent of that wage bill towards the apprenticeship levy as a, as a, a funding for, for apprenticeships throughout industry. Now, the levy can only be used to pay for delivery of apprenticeships in England 
And for employers that don't contribute towards the levy, um, basically those that have a wage bill less than three million, uh, the government will pay 90% of the total cost of delivery, uh, but the employer must still contribute 10% of that cost. An important thing to notice as well, that should be in cash uh, and not some sort of payment in kind either. So providers wishing to deliver apprenticeship standards and any existing SACE framework from April 2017 have had to be on the approved register of approved apprenticeship training organisations. And you'll find as we go through today, there are lots of acronyms involved here. I'm just hoping that I can remember what they all are and remember them accurately, um, since the name of that particular one may have changed since this presentation was written. Um, and basically this register allows any providers to contract directly with employers who will be using levy funds to pay for the delivery of apprenticeships. Employers who are co-funded will still have to contract with a provider that also has an education and skills funding agency contract. Some more acronyms, S for ESFA. Now, an apprenticeship standard contains three elements that have to be assessed. And they are skills, knowledge, and behaviors. That's not dissimilar to the current SACE framework where we have knowledge, qualifications, competency, qualifications or, or skills um, and personal learning and thinking skills. And the difference being that behaviours are probably the most important element to employers upon completion of the apprenticeship. Another key point to make is that at present the achievement of the apprenticeship under SACE is once a learner has completed all mandatory qualifications. In an apprenticeship standard, even where there are mandatory qualifications, the achievement of the qualification doesn't indicate achievement of the apprenticeship. An apprentice might not complete their endpoint assessment for a long period of time after the completion of any qualifications. Basically, they have to wait until the employer is satisfied that the learner is demonstrating the full occupa uh, occupational competences um, as outlined by the assessment plan. Uh, and any other additional requirements that also might be included there. So a lot of information um, uh, summarised on the slide sat in front of you. So the minimum uh, programme length is 12 months. Uh, there is an independent end of point assessment to confirm the occupational competence and so you can't be deemed as having completed the apprenticeship until that has been completed, even if you have completed all of the mandatory qualifications um, that are within that apprenticeship. And um, there is 20% mandatory off the job training, so it can't all be done um, at work itself. And there is that mandatory employer cash contribution, which is either 10% if you or your wage bill is less than 3 million quid a year, or uh, it is your, le your levy um, contribution if your wage bill is greater than that. And there are no mandatory qualifications in there except for maths and English. So, the engineering and manufacturing standards. 73 standards with either the apprenticeship standard approved or are approved um, uh, for delivering uh, the engineering and manufacturing sector. So lots and lots of um, stuff going off in that particular sector. They range from the level two right up to the level seven. Um, and apprenticeship standards start um, in 2016-17, which they are doing now with 2,460 starts in, during that period. Um, and the largest volume of learner starts is within the engineering technician apprenticeship, where there were 770 starts. Now, as I said, engineering and manufacturing is the biggest or are the biggest sectors across the 15 others um, in terms of the volume of standards available or the, but the, the number of standards that are actually still in development. It's closely followed by construction sectors. Standards in this sector tend to be longer than the minimum 12 months that is seen in other sectors, if you remember it was on the previous slide, and it demonstrates really the depth of skills and knowledge required within occupations in the engineering and manufacturing sectors, even at level two. Employers involved in developing these standards have in the main been large employers, um, and people like BAE SEST Systems, Rolls-Royce, Jaguar Land Rover, Network Rail, uh, and British Nuclear have all been involved. But you must remember also that the requirements of small um, and medium-sized enterprises, the old SMEs, have also been taken into consideration and even um, some, uh, employers that are smaller than that. By organization, organizations like GTA, and here we start with the, the acronyms again, um, for those of you not familiar, the Group Training Association in England, the EEF, the uh, Engineering Employers Federation, and the NFEC, which is the National Forum of Engineering Centres, have all been included in the development of apprenticeship standards and the assessment plans. 
and it's their role in there to be the voice of these smaller employers um, so that they're not swallowed up by the requirements of these large multinationals. So these employer groups have also been included in any consultation that's occurred prior to the standard and the assessment plans being approved for delivery. So they have employment right from the conception to the end point of, of where these things are released for delivery. Now engineering sectors that have apprenticeship standards include rail, uh, nuclear, energy and utilities, engineering design and draftspersons uh, and other cross-sector roles including engineering construction. And work is commencing with the Institute for Apprenticeships to look at rationalising occupations and standards to see where employer groups can work together to develop additional cross-sector occupations or where similar occupations in terms of delivery and assessment can be merged into a single standard with a single core uh, and options approach, which is the, the general approach that's been taken about these things. So the engineering and manufacturing standards. As the main standards that are used um, in the engineering technician courses, and there are a range of occupations that are available, um, the engineering technical support, mechatronics and maintenance, machinists, aerospace, manufacturing, fitter, aerospace, mechanical, electrical systems, uh, maintenance fitters in aerospace as well, plus product design and development, and also a number of marine occupations as well. Uh, and many of these occupations have, have been around for a while, they've been active for uh, now on three years, and the first endpoint assessments for the mechatronics technician, for example, took place in September 17, with the majority of the first cohort of learners um, sitting their endpoint assessment between March and September 2018. The first cohort of aerospace learners will be preparing for endpoint assessments around June to September of 2018. So these things are on with, and they are being completed, and, and uh, the build up to these endpoint um, assessments are being. Considered. Now, there are additional occupations that are being considered for inclusion into the standard. Um, however, as the standard doesn't cover 100% of the IFA guidelines in terms of independence, the employer groups aren't able to add these at present. Uh, discussions are underway with the IFA to include additional occupations, things like manufacturing technician and fabricator and a range of others. But until a decision is reached, I'm afraid these occupations will have to be developed as standalone um, qualifications, if you like, and integrated only when that's possible. This standard, as well as many other engineering standards, has a foundation phase that needs to be completed, which includes level two competence qualifications. Employers believe that competent employees should have basic hand skills, which is, as we all know, probably very relevant in many of these occupations. And the ability to use machinery, again, something that uh, we need to promote in, in training areas, um, and relevant equipment as part of any role that they might have within industry, which is fair enough. And this requirement is different to the required level of a level two apprenticeship. Um, so, engineering and manufacturing standards. Let's have a little book, a little look at these ones. Um, the new standards that we conceive as being popular. Um, these are the ones that, uh, that the take-up is expected to be high on. Here's the Improvement Technician at Level 3, which replaced the Business um, Improvement Techniques Level 2 course, and then they, they escalate up to uh, the Improvement Practitioner at Level 4, then Improvement Leader at Level 5, and then uh, the Maintenance and Operations Engineering Technician, or a MOE, I believe, or a MOET, it's called. Um, if we're a Champagne region, it will be MOE, I'm sure, at Level 3. Um, Rail Engineering Technician at Level 3, um, all the Level 6 uh, Apprenticeship Standards um, will be popular, we're sure, as well as the Level 7 Postgraduate Engineering stuff as well. Now, there's another occupation or a couple that, that uh, is not listed in the composite uh, here, and that's the Composites Technician Standard at Level 3. Um, fairly sure this will be popular across a range of sectors because those, that technology is used um, increasingly across a range of sectors, including things like aerospace and automotive, as well as in general fabrication and manufacturing now. Uh, composite materials are used in all engineering and manufacturing environments and we do need a skilled workforce of technicians and engineers to continue developing new composite materials, many of which the UK is a, a, an industry leader on or a world leader in, in this technology um, to make sure that we're incorporating any new developments into this because it is a very a quickly and fast developing changing field of engineering. Now the improvement roles, the, uh, the ones that replace the business improvement techniques um, they are within the new apprenticeship standards, but they, 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 they've replaced, if you like, the existing business improvement frameworks. Um, 
And these new standards have been developed with employers such as Toyota, famous for its business improvement technique systems, and BT and the BBC and the range of other organisations. Um, and this group was formed of three separate groups trying to develop similar standards. They currently, the business improvement techniques is at level two. However, going forward, the lowest level of occupation will be at level three. And the standard will follow a more of an industry standard approach, the Six Sigma approach um, of yellow belt, green belt, black belt, and perhaps even master black belt progression as it moves through the different levels. More information is being developed by the employers groups and we'll be developing an appropriate on-program endpoint and endpoint assessment offer when we have more details on those for those particular areas. Now the MOE, the MOET, uh, the Maintenance and Operations Engineering Technician Standard has been developed by uh, the Energy Utilities, the Energy and Utilities Group uh, and contains a single skilled maintenance technician role that could be mechanical or electrical. Um, and this might be appropriate for some employers, but you would need to ensure that the requirements of the whole standard can be met and not just that of that particular role. Now, the level six apprenticeship standards all have a degree as is, mandatory, as is a mandatory requirement. However, routes to the degree can be at the demand of the employer. So apprentices completing a HNC, a HND or a foundation degree and then topping up to a full bachelor's degree is accepted as well as those apprentices who are direct entrance to a full degree program. Um, and this can be de determined by the employer. Uh, there are no hard and fast ways of doing that. Level seven programs are being viewed by many large employers as a replacement for their current graduate entry programs. And this occupation allows apprentices to move between departments if required before they complete a specific pathway. So that's a, a quick run through the manufacturing standards as they currently stand. So we'll look at the next bit, which is talking about the standards that are still in development. So as mentioned in some of the previous slides, um, some of these occupations might be included eventually in the engineering technician standard at level three where appropriate. Um, but the level two standards are designed as standalone occupations and are not to be used as a stepping stone to a level three apprenticeship. Um, so things like the uh, operations, uh, sorry, the manufacturing operative, the engineering operative at level two, the manufacturing technician, and fabricator at level three, including welding, uh, and then the propulsion technician and heritage restoration technician, which sounds great to me, at levels three and four. The level two standards, um, as we said, they are designed as standalone occupations and not a stepping stone to level three, um, and they should only be used where the apprentices are being actually employed in these job roles. So the apprentices will be able to progress to the next level of apprenticeship, but it's not expected that this will be the case for all apprentices. So the propulsion technicians are involved in engine technology and include engine development as well as engine testing. So a fairly um, industry specific as things these, these things should do uh, and technical area. And the heritage restoration covers cars uh, and vans, lorries, aircraft, and uh, as well as rail equipment and other things. Um, so if you have any employers wishing to be involved who uh, we can let you know the details of this group after this presentation so we can let them know the details of this group after the presentation so they can get involved potentially um, in the development of these different standards. So we're talking a little bit about our on program and endpoint assessments. Um, so many engineering apprenticeships have mandatory qualifications that are contained within them, some com uh, competence qualifications like the NVQs or, or knowledge qualifications. Uh, and these have been designed by employers to meet the requirements of the apprenticeship occupations. Now, where a standard does or doesn't have uh, mandatory qualifications, like some of them, like the, the, the MOE, for instance, the uh, Maintenance Operations Engineering Technician, providers can choose to deliver a qualification. However, it might not be funded from the levy and employers should be consulted prior to delivery. So the EPA for many standards are linked to professional recognition. Um, uh, and and they, they feed into the, um, the PEIs, the professional engineering institutions. And um, in, some in some instances, though, that's not the case. Um, and so a PSNR reviewing the requirements prior to making an application to offer some of the EPAs for some areas. So the engineering and manufacturing sector um, effectively have been adamant that qualifications are a necessary requirement as part of the apprenticeships and have sought uh, approval from government ministers who have these uh, uh, basically approved this approach within the new apprenticeship standards. 
However, at present, uh, not all standards um, do have mandatory qualifications, uh, but these are usually knowledge and competence qualifications. Now, in the current sales qualifications, the knowledge qualification elements are usually the BTEC nationals, um, level three ones, and they can also be delivered currently to full-time students, enabling you to co-deliver. Um, so you can have full-time students doing the BTEC national as well as delivering the same thing to your apprentices. But for the apprenticeship standards, the employers have designed the knowledge qualifications to meet their requirements. So it's a different qualification to that that you will be or could have in the past delivered to your full-time students. Now, the new knowledge qualification that's been used for many engineering apprenticeship standards is the Level 3 BTEC Specialist Qualification in Advanced Engineering and Manufacturing. So that's the specific one that they've chosen as being most relevant. Now, the many Level 3 standards um, have specified that the diploma, the 720 Guided Learning Hour Size Qualification, is the smallest size required for an apprenticeship. However, the, where a qualification isn't specified as mandatory and you wish to use this qualification, you can complete whichever size qualification suits you and your employer best. So if, you're, if it requires um, a mandatory element, it must be a minimum size diploma, but if it doesn't, you can still use it um, uh, and you can use any size of it. That advanced manufacturing qualification is based very heavily on, on some existing QCF BTEC nationals in engineering. Um, it is funded uh, for 16 to 18 learners as a standalone qualification, but not 19 plus. And it also doesn't attract any performance table points if any of you are in schools, which I don't think you are. Uh, it does attract UCAS points, however, so it does count when uh, your apprentices will go further to apply for uh, university places, perhaps. Uh, and it also can't be used as part of the delivery for SACE apprenticeships. However, it is possible to map this back to the QCF version and claim that instead. So, um, Many engineering apprenticeships, as we said a little earlier, are mapped onto um, the, the EPA processes, the endpoint assessment processes, are mapped onto some uh, professional recognition um, elements um, as defined by the professional engineering institutions. So, for, for example, the, the engineering technician level at, three, at level three to four, um, incorpor incorporated engineer, um, at level five to six, and then the full chartered engineering status at level seven to eight. Um, obviously, they're controlled by the Institute of Mechanical Engineers or the Institute of Engineering and Technology or whichever one is, is doing at the time. And they can only be awarded by those engineering institutions. And that's the reason why um, EPAs can't be offered directly by Pearson. Um, however, we are in discussion with some of these professional bodies to see how we can support the EPA process um, to do some of that admin and, and design on their behalf. Now, as I mentioned, where the EPA isn't linked to a professional membership uh, recognition, any of these things, such as the, the MOE, the MOET, we are looking at the requirements of endpoint assessment and seeing if we're able to deliver a high quality service within the funding allocated for the standard. Um, and we will be making applications for those occupations where we identify we can deliver an EPA service that the standard requires. An example of this is a level seven, uh, sort of put my teeth back in again, uh, is a level seven systems engineering standard. Uh, we can't offer uh, an on program element uh, as this is a postgraduate diploma or master's qualification, but we are the approved EPA provider for this standard. And the first EPA um, for that particular course is uh, scheduled for 2019. So, what are the plans for the future? Um, some of the things that are planned for the future is to find and, and identify and add further occup occupations to the engineering technician standard. To do that gap analysis that we talked about, we invited some uh, input on in terms of yourselves and any um, employers that you um, uh, are familiar with, um, uh, asking you what those gaps are, and what bits do we need to cover that we've not covered, um, and also from an employer's point of view as well and to look at how apprenticeship standards fit into the new T-levels um, and how these qualifications can be mapped across to each other and also to develop further qualifications as required um, and make a decision on the, on the EPA for certain uh, qualifications. So in summary, the plans are pretty fluid uh, and it all depends on how the apprenticeship standards and the requirements for the new standards change in the future. Um, having said that, that a lot's changed in the last four years, since we've been working with employer groups, who knows what the next four years might hold. New developments such as the T-levels, or relatively new developments, so we'll be working with the, the DFE 
um, on T levels and the T level panels uh, to help shape the future apprenticeship going forward. Um, and we're looking at ensuring that what's required of full time learners and apprentices is matched as much as possible to enable that joint delivery between full time learners and, and apprentices, which makes life a whole lot easier. Now, the new engineering T levels are due to launch in either 2020 or 2021. And they will be offered by apparently a single awarding organization that may or may not be Pearson, depending on whether they win that contract, or it could be a Pearson form part of a consortium of awarding organizations. Um, and employers are currently working on occupational maps and the qualification requirements that meet each area. Now, it's likely that there's going to be a standard approach to this. It's likely to be a core and options approach with a common core and a minimum of three pathways that will look something like an engineering design pathway, um, a manufacturing and processing pathway, and a ma maintenance pathway. Now, um, I, we can't add a great deal more to this at this moment in time, but we will hold further update sessions on T-levels and how this will impact engineering over the coming months, but only as and when more information comes to light in terms of policy and how that policy has been interpreted by the DfE.